uh, fine to start. Have a nice uh, welcome applause for uh, Kathy. Ko bawan te awa, ko Kathy Reed toko inoa. Na mihi nui kia koutu, kia kaha te reo Māori. Greetings. I'm Kathy Reed. I'm from Geelong near the Bowen River. First of all, I'd like you to join me in thanking Ray, Jimmy and Hoop, our volunteers for the session today. Thank you. Up until recently, I led developer relations at Mycroft AI. Oh. Come on. It helps if I have the focus on the right window. Up until recently, I led developer relations at Mycroft AI. Mycroft is quite unique in that it's one of the only open source voice stacks in the world. Many of the voice products that are available today are proprietary and commercial based. And we have a significant gap in this in the open source space. And that's one of the things I'm really passionate about helping, helping close the gap there. If the live demo gods are on my side, I'll be able to do a little bit of a demo, but I will be pressed for time today. Uh, and I'll be delighted to take your questions, but please do leave them uh, until the end of the session. Not too long ago, a couple of decades, voice control was the realm of science fiction. Any Knight Rider fans in the house? Yep. Hello, computer. Any Star Trek fans in the house? Excellent. Bonus points if anyone can tell me where this is from. But oh, too late. This is Time Tracks. This was a 1993 uh, series that ran for two seasons, a co-production from Australia and America. And Selma the Hologram was voice enabled. So as we're going from science fiction to science fact, we're using a lot more voice interfaces. And what I'd like to do today is take you through the voice stack and how it relates to open source software and do a bit of a deep dive at each of those layers in the stack. How many people here are reasonably familiar with what's in a voice stack? Excellent. <laughs> oh, sorry, inside voice, inside voice. So in a voice stack, we have layers, just like you might have in a web stack or in an application stack. Uh, anyone mind if I use the laser pointer? Excellent. So what we start off, where's my laser? There we go. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not in an airport. So what we start off with is a wake word, also called a hot word. And this tells the voice stack, get ready to be commanded. I'm about to send you a command. So that might be something like, hey, Mycroft, or Alexa, or computer, or in my case, you rotten bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> then what we do is have an utterance. Oh, I can't get my laser going, you can read this. Um, we have an utterance, which is the phrase or the command that goes through a speech to text processor, which turns the sounds of my voice into text so that we can use it programmatically. And that utterance will have some key words and some things that we use. Then it goes off and runs a command. And then it comes back. And at the bottom there, you can see a dialogue. And we do that using text-to-speech. So it will say something like, OK, five minutes, starting now. And if you think, if you think in terms of HTTP or other request response life cycles, this is the life cycle of a voice request. So that's it. That's it in a nutshell. So I'm going to go through each of the layers in the voice stack and give you a little bit more information about each of them. And some of the open source tools that we're currently using, their challenges, and where we think we're going long term. So Pocket Sphinx was one of the first wake word engines 
It's a project out of the larger CMU Sphinx out of Carnegie Mellon. And the way that Pocket Sphinx works is to do wake word recognition based on phonemes. I'm sure I heard somebody ask. What is a phoneme? What's a phoneme? Thank you. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so a phoneme is the smallest unit of sound that distinguishes one word from another in a particular language. Different languages have different phonemes. My first degree was in languages, so I love this stuff. So the next question you're going to have is, what are all the phonemes in the English language? What are all the phonemes? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Here are all the phonemes in the English language. Um, it's OK, I won't pop quiz you. There's not going to be an exam. Um, but one of the things you need to know from this slide is that not all of the sounds that people make are covered by phonemes in the English language. My first degree was in Indonesian language, and there's a phoneme in Indonesian that sounds like Arr. Sorry, that was a really bad example. But imagine that you're rolling your R's. Arr. Excellent. <laughs> Very well done. There's no phoneme for that in English. So if you're an Indonesian speaker, you're much more likely to roll your R's. <laughs> or Dutch. Or German. German has this, you know, I don't want to go off on a tangent already, but Joan has this really hard SZ sound, and that's not in English either. So if you're a German speaker, you're much more likely to say it with a very um, harsh SZ sound. Anyway, the wake word engine trips up because it only knows about phonemes in a particular language. So there's one of our challenges. We also have similar sounding phonemes, and again, we're going to have some audience participation. So I would like this half of the room to say the word pizza. One, two, three. Pizza. Thank you. Now I want this half of the room, oh God, exercise. I want this half of the room to say pizza. One, two, three. Pizza. One, two, three. Pizza. One, two, three. Pizza. One, two, three. Pizza. OK, who can tell me the difference? But it was really hard to tell the difference, wasn't it? So imagine a wake word recognizer <laughs> that's trying to tell the difference between pizza and pizza. Major challenge. The other thing that's really challenging about, wa about wake words, I've got to catch my breath, geez, I'm unfit, <sighs> is that they're always listening. And this is one of the major issues with voice technology at the moment. So if you have a voice assistant and it's connected to the internet, <laughs> you see where I'm going, it's possible for your wake word recording, because it needs to record the audio to compare the phoneme or to compare the sound, it's possible that that will go up to the internet. In fact, if you use Alexa or Google Home or Cortana or Bixby, that's exactly what it does. So the recording slightly before when you say Alexa or OK Google is going up to the cloud. Kind of scary, isn't it? Very scary. The other way that we do wake word recognition other than on phonemes is using neural networks. So if I go back a couple of slides, Sorry, I'm not going to make you beats or pizza again. It's OK. There's a couple of other wake word engines that take a slightly different approach. So Snowboy and Mycroft Precise use a neural network to detect between uh, what is a wake word and what isn't a wake word. And I'll get to that in a little while. So if everything's always listening, that can cause some incredible challenges. So I want you to think about where you might put a voice assistant in a house. How many of <laughs> no, now you're waking up to what I'm getting to. How many of you might have a voice ass assistant in the lounge room? A few people. So the lounge room is 
generally quite a social space. I wouldn't call it public because people don't walk in off the street and sit on your couch, not usually. How many people might have a voice assistant in the bathroom or the study? Maybe. It's more personal of a space. How many of you have a voice assistant on your nightstand or your bedside table? Yep. Or on your phone. That's in quite intimate space. <laughs> and what we found as we've been training uh, from the people who've opted in, opt in, um, we don't do it without opting in, but what we found is that we hear all sorts of things as we record the wake word to train it. We hear people engaging in intimate acts. So if you have a voice assistant by your bed, it's going to pick up things that, that happen there. I've heard people having quite heated arguments. Um, luckily, uh, and on quite a serious note, I've never heard domestic violence when I've been training our wake word because I'm not quite sure how I would handle that ethically. It's quite a, quite a difficult ethical question. I've heard people losing their temper with disobedient children and thinking, gee, I know this data is completely anonymized and I have no idea who you are, but I wish I did because I'd be sending you some gin about now because it sounds like what you need. <laughs> and I've also heard myself swearing like a sailor when I've got frustrated. <laughs> oh, Kathy, didn't know you could use three F words in one sentence and still be grammatically correct. So would anyone like to hear what training a wake word listener sounds like? Yeah, look, <laughs> you're all voyeurs, it's fantastic. <laughs> Bear with me, because I've got to figure out how to use the computer. I swear I'm good with computers. Now, code of conduct warning, I haven't queued up any of the samples previously, so I have no idea what we're going to hear. So I don't think we have any minors in the room. Okay. That's not Hey Mycroft. <laughs> That's Hey Mycroft. See, it's all boring. But you can start to see how we hear the background going goings on of what's going on in someone's world. No. No. More on languages later. So I've got a slide up here which is about Haber's classification of contexts. And I'm not going to get too academic, it's okay, you don't need to run out the door quite yet. But this is a framework that we use to, to think about conceptualising where we're placing voice assistance. And if you think about this in the bigger picture, it's not just applicable to voice assistance, it's applicable to many types of IoT devices or many types of assistance. But this is what we use to help frame our thinking about where a voice assistant is in someone's personal, intimate or social space. So you can see immediately that we have some challenges. And we've got some interesting responses to those challenges as well. This is Project Alias. Right. Sorry, that's about as good as I'm going to get it. This is Project Alias, and this is essentially a proxy server for a wake word. So what happens is that this little hat gets put on top of your voice assistant and it has a fan in it. <laughs> so it, drown, like, it, it means the microphone in your Alexa or your Google Home can't actually hear the wake word. And then you set a wake word, another wake word, on the alias device that wakes this up and then the alias device says the real wake word to the underlying. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a proxy server for Alexa. I mean, <laughs> or, you could just use a voice assistant that doesn't sell your personal data, <coughs> Mycroft. <laughs> so it's a little bit about wake words and always listening and how we deal with that. The other issue that we have with wake words is accuracy. How many people here have been so frustrated when you go to use Alexa or OK Google 
and it doesn't recognise that you're waking it up. Okay, quite a few people. It's really, really frustrating. It can really damage your voice user experience, your experience of that product. So it's really important we get it right. Sorry, I swear I work with computers. So there are four, there are four states that we train for. Two, two success states and two failure states. So whether the wake word has correctly detected a wake word, whether it's woken up without a wake word, uh, and the opposite of that as well. This all sounds really, really simple, doesn't it? Really simple? <laughs> yeah, nah. What we've seen at Mycroft AI, I can't speak for any other of the voice providers, but what I've seen at Mycroft AI is that we have significant biases in our training data sets. We have a sample rate of about one to 10 male to non-male voice samples. Yep. <clears throat> Coincidentally, it's about the ratio of people in this room. <laughs> That's right, because why on earth would women use computers? <laughs> in our data set, there are also significantly more samples from American uh, people who speak with an American accent versus people who speak with an Australian accent or Latin American or Indian or African. So imagine the Venn diagram, if you will. Women who use a voice assistant, women from Australia who use a voice assistant. I had a lot of fun for my first five months at Mycroft getting it to actually recognise me. <laughs> Logically, you're correct. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so this means that if you're a woman who's not American, you're going to be challenged in having the voice assistant recognise you. And we had to think really critically about this at Mycroft. One of the options that we had available was to basically drop male samples from the data set to try and even up that ratio a bit. Can anyone guess what the challenge is with that? Partially, because we're taking away those samples. Yes? Uh, we're laughing, but that's actually a significant issue. Um, you lose the Australian males. <laughs> sort of, but you're all getting very close to the answer, which is we had to tag everything. So we would have to know who, has, who identifies as male, what ethnicity you identify as, so that we could classify the sample. And that was something we were deeply, deeply uncomfortable with as a privacy-based company. Very deeply uncomfortable. Particularly the cultural and ethnic heritage. Longer term, where I think this is going, is that individuals will train their own wake word samples. So you'll train an engine on what you sound like, and then it'll be uh, trained against a whole you know, millions and millions of data points of yes, this is a wake word or no, it isn't. But I also have some deep ethical concerns with that as well. Damn my moral conscience. Could a voice assistant be used to identify an individual? Yep. What access would the government have to that data? particularly given the recent passage of the Access and Assistant Act, one of the most myopic, technically deficient, retrograde pieces of legislation we've seen since metadata retention. <laughs> <laughs> this might sound alarmist, you know, Kathy, paranoid, get her a tinfoil hat, but we've increasingly seen warrantless access warrantless access to platform data 
by agencies who have peripheral or tangential claims to that data. Yep. That doesn't sit well with me at all. So you can see that even in the solutions to the problems that we have with open source voice, they open themselves up to even more challenges. It's like the origami paper. You unfold one part and there's, there's like a new layer happening. So that's some of the challenges with wake words. Let's move on to speech to text. So accurate speech to text, the, the part where we take what you say and turn it into words, is one of the most challenging parts of the voice stack. Kaldi is one of the most popular speech to text engines available. Uh, it works on device, so it doesn't have to go out to the cloud. Again, a good privacy tick there. The downside with Kaldi is that it's compute heavy. Excuse me. You can't run it on a Raspberry Pi, so it needs a fairly, fairly beefy machine to use. But the thing to note is that responsiveness is one of the key features of a, a good voice user interface. Some of the other work that's been done here is by Mozilla. Do we have any Mozillians in the house? Yes. Thank you. Honestly, thank you for the work that you're doing here. This is Common Voice from Mozilla, and I've deliberately used this slide because it differentiates open source voice from proprietary voice in a very clear way. Do you see the languages that are used there? Some of those are very niche. They may not be spoken by a large contingent, by a large cohort. And that's because for proprietary and commercial solutions, they're generally going after the largest market or the most profitable market. And that's not necessarily equitable. It's not necessarily fair. And what's happening here is that uh, the Common Voice Project is gaining samples of people's voice from different ethnicities and different cultures, and then those recordings are being fed into a speech-to-text engine called Deep Speech. Deep Speech is really, really gaining traction. However, at the moment, it's still not quite accurate enough uh, to be mainstream, but it's, it's certainly happening very quickly. So some of the challenges that we have with speech to text are very similar to wake words. We have issues in training the model uh, and making sure that the model is continually trained on new data and that we're getting it more and more accurate. Because inaccurate speech to text is really, really frustrating for an end user, as in, who is anyone who was in my talk on Tuesday found when I tried to play a <laughs> playlist with a swear word in it. One of the toughest parts to deal with in speech to text, though, is accents. I'm Australian. <laughs> so I speak Australian, right? Yeah. Do we have any Queenslanders here? <laughs> no, I'm going to get lynched. I won't say anything more. <laughs> the key point is that people, even if they're from the same country, have different accents. Imagine, imagine the Midwestern accent, yo, and then you have Brooklyn, or you have the Boston accent. So even in the same country, there are different accents. And voice assistants have a really, really hard time understanding accents. So what we find is that STT engines, speech-to-text engines, end up being trained for particular countries or particular groups of people. Um, so yes, Google STT actually has an Australian uh, STT engine, but it can't quite deal <laughs> with the very elongated, elongated flat A's. The other thing that speech-to-text engines have a really tough time with <laughs> is slang. Okay, hands up if you don't identify as Australian. <laughs> We're in trouble. <laughs> Does, does anyone want to have a? <laughs> Would you do the honours, Lana? Please. Yeah, no, mate. As we have England brought in, the West is strong. It's like the Zerg Island, like the David Thomas. Would anyone who's not an Australian 
I'd like to have a go at translating. Emily. Very well done. Round of applause for Emily. You're very, very, very close. I think you're a closet Australian. <laughs> so, yes. Greetings, friend. There's been a car accident in Broadmeadows and the Western Freeway is congested. Back to the service station and as a result, I will be late to the social function at Mr Thompson's. <laughs> Never in a hundred years would an Australian say that. <laughs> but that's exactly what an STT engine is expecting. Now, Emily, can I ask you what sort of rule sets or what sort of processing you went through to arrive at your conclusion, which was scarily accurate? <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what an STT engine would do. The trouble is, <laughs> can you imagine trying to feed all the slang in Australian into an STT engine? <laughs> so yes, not a, not a small challenge. So where are we going longer term? I suspect what we're going to do is have a very similar approach to that that we're going to use for wake words we're going to be training STT engines on our individual voices, which means in my case, it's gonna get the swear words absolutely <laughs> spot on. But there's a downside to that as well. STT engines are trained on hundreds of thousands and millions and millions of data points. I'm not going to speak to a device enough to get enough samples to, uh, to train it effectively. So there's another challenge with that as well. At the moment, the STT engines are trained from multiple people with multiple slightly different accents. So I think we're going to see some real challenges there. We're not going to see this solved in the next couple of years, but that's where we're going. Okie dokie. One of the other things that I want to spend a little bit of time on because I think it's incredibly important is the role of open source voice technologies and endangered languages. How many people speak a language other than English? Okay, thank you. There's a whole lot of work around classifying endangered languages. I, I won't go into that here. But what we found time and again is that there's often no commercial imperative for bringing uh, niche languages or languages that only have a few speakers to market. I think it's a really, really good engaging emerging research topic of how do we use open voice assistance to help save some of those languages. Particularly in the Northern Territory and Western Australia, there are a number of indigenous languages where the native speakers of those languages are in their 50s and 60s. And for Aboriginal Australians, that usually means they're coming towards the end of their life. We're losing these languages as those generations die out. And wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a voice assistant available in Yolngumata, or Wolpiri, or Tokpisan, or Pichanjajara? We may not be so far away from that. Just need to make sure. No. Bear with me. So this is Mycroft Translate. Very alpha, very, very early days. This is based on a platform called Poodle, and if you've done any work with KDE or LibreOffice, you may have seen this platform before, but what we're trying to do with Mycroft Translate is translate all of the command words, all of the phrases that are spoken, which are primarily in English and German at the moment, into over 40 languages on this platform. 
And we're also building out the tools that will help speakers of those niche languages record their voice so that you can have a text-to-speech engine in your native voice across a range of genders. So we're starting to build out these tools. Very early days, but that's open and available now. Uh, some level of automation, somebody uh, submits a new skill to Mycroft, within an hour that's picked up and added to the Translate platform. Some languages are more active than others. Uh, if there's not a language, if your language is not on there and you'd like it on there, let me know, uh, and we can add it quite easily. This isn't perfect though, and we've got some key issues with translation. At the moment, the way that we handle translation is to go line by line. So if you've got a skill that's asking about the weather, you're having to do a line by line translation. You don't see the broader context or the broader picture of how that skill operates. So that's something we want to refactor. Excuse me. <clears throat> that's something that we want to refactor shortly. We also have issues with gender and hierarchy. <laughs> Not the usual ones. Does anyone here speak a Romance language like French or German? <laughs> and you know, sorry? Oh, sorry. <laughs> and here we have the taxonomy problem with languages. <laughs> Does anybody speak a language that has gendered nouns? <laughs> sorry, I should have phrased that better. Okay. So in French, I think a bridge is feminine, and in German, the bridge is masculine? Feminine? Apologies? Mm -hmm. We have no way of representing that <laughs> with Mycroft translation, with Mycroft Translate at the moment. So we get translations that are not quite right. It's like the um, uncanny valley effect that you get with CGI, where it's so close to being human, it's, it's unsettling. We get that effect with translations. We also have issues with formality. So Australian is probably the least formal language <laughs> ever. Japanese, incredibly formal. Bahasa Indonesia, Bahasa Malaya, incredibly formal. You use different phrases if you're addressed. Exactly. And I think is it Thai that has a special strata of language for dealing with the royal family? In incredible levels of formality. We can't handle that yet. So it's a key challenge. Um, that's something that we want to do uh, over time. So I'm going to move on from speech to text. Cover that, but I will leave you. <laughs> we don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> what Coke has tried to do here is combine Australian with Maori. Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> equally. So, if you, if anyone here is a Maori reader, you would read this as Kiora Mate. Hello, death. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it might just be Coke using honest advertising, <laughs> but I don't think so. <laughs> the, the point that I'm making is that cultural context translations, they're really, really hard, and we've got a long way to go with them. But we're thinking about it. Uh, and I think we're on the right track with the avenues that we have to solve that problem. So now I'm going to talk about intent passes. And this is the part of the voice stack where the voice stack tries to figure out what you want it to do. You know, this is where I say, hey, Mycroft, what's in a margarita? I want to make a margarita. <laughs> it's almost margarita time. We have Rasa which is available with both open source and commercial licenses. It's used quite a lot in chatbots. And Mycroft has two intent parsers as well. So if you're interested, um, I'll put all of this up later. Adapt is basically like a bag of keywords. So if you have, say, cocktail and make, 
in your phrase, it knows that you've got those two keywords and you're probably looking to make a cocktail and I'm going to pass it to the cocktail skill, which probably gets used far more often than Kathy really should. Podatius uses things a little bit differently. It has something called an entity file, so you can give it examples of what the command is trying to do, and it learns from those examples. So it's less bag of keywords and much more example driven. <clears throat> but we have a key issue with intent passes as well. Excuse me. We often get ambiguous intent. So let's say I said to my voice stack, play the news. Seems really simple, doesn't it? <laughs> what news do I want? <laughs> I don't want Fox News. Or am I asking it to play a song? Do I want it to play Huey Lewis in the news? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry, Huey Lewis in the news. So we need to disambiguate intent. And the way that we're tackling this at the moment is to use a, basically a confidence scoring system based on how specific the utterance is, based on how specific the, the phrase that someone is saying. So if I said, hey, Mycroft, play something by the Whitlams on Spotify, it will match very, very confidently to Spotify for two reasons. I said Spotify. And I also used the name of a band. Any Whitlams fans in the house? Yeah. Good Melbourne band. So this is how we're trying to disambiguate intents and prevent intent collisions. Text-to-speech. So there are quite a few text-to-speech open source uh, models on the market. Market, GitHub. Mary TTS is very useful for European languages. Uh, it's got quite a few European languages already coded into TTS. We also have eSpeak, which has about 20 text-to-speech models, although the, the accuracy and the recording of those TTS models varies considerably between languages. We use Mimic, which can be used on device. It's a fork of CMU Flight, and we've got two English voices available for Mimic. But what we're working on at the moment is Mimic 2, uh, which is a Tacitron-based implementation. And we've just released, drum roll. Yeah. <laughs> that was just to wake you up, by the way. We've just released Mimic Recording Studio. So this is a Docker-based image, completely free and open source where you can record your voice and then using Mimic 2, which we've also released uh, under an Apache 2 license, you can train your voice using Tacatron to create your own TTS engine. But wait. <laughs> sort of. It, it looks really easy, doesn't it? except to get a decent model, you're probably going to need to record between 40 and 60 hours of audio. Yeah, yeah, this is why TTS is so hard. But if you're really interested and you're really keen, this is available now, you spin it up using a Docker instance, dead easy. So I've spoken a little bit about the Mimic Recording Studio and how it helps you get a very natural sounding voice by keeping a very, uh, it helps you create a very even tone and a very even pacing. So that if you're doing the recording like this and one day you're speaking very, very fast because you have four cups of coffee and you can't actually slow down, and then the next day you're speaking like this because you, <laughs> you haven't had enough sleep, the end, the end model isn't going to be particularly consistent. So Mimic Recording Studio helps try and um, train you out of some of those issues. Pronunciations, though, often require correction even after training. Uh, the Maori word for New Zealand, <laughs> Aotearoa. I tried playing that using Mimic 2, <laughs> wasn't even close. Um, so I thought I'd better fix that up before I, I get to Linux Conf AU. And the way that we do that 
is that we have a pronounced layer that runs over the top of Mimic 2. So once we've trained the voice on, you know, 40 to 60 hours of recording, it gets reasonably close, but then we still have to tweak some of the pronunciations. And we've got an open tool that helps the community change those pronunciations. Then we have people who administer that and, and make sure that it's correct. So again, very open, very collaborative. So, as you can see, there's quite an emerging range of open source tools that are available in the voice space, each with their own benefits and drawbacks. But one thing is for certain though, open source voice is here to stay and it's gaining maturity every single day. I'd just like to leave you with this one quote from someone I admire considerably. When the whole world is silent, even one voice becomes powerful. And this is the power of open source voice. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hoop. Um, do we have time for questions? Yes. Still a few minutes. Please. Okay. I actually have two questions. Uh, one is, you've been mostly talking about open source recognition for commands. What about for dictation and things like that? Are they good tools? Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, very good question, by the way. What I'd like to do is draw a distinction between how we do open source speech recognition in that voice life cycle and the ability to do real-time dictation. So in that voice life cycle, you say something, it gets translated, it gets intent passed, the command executes and you get some feedback. If I were to take um, a, a real-time dictation of what I'm saying now, it would be using a stream. So it's not tokenized, it's not serialized, it's a stream. And then you'd have to have a stream coming back. So it's possible and we think we can do it, but we haven't tried it yet. But Theoretically, yes. Practically, not sure yet. Okay. And the other question is, uh, the text-to-speech you were talking about is using recorded speech and then playing it back. Whereas last time I was working in voice synthesis, you were generating formants and air sounds and all sorts of things like that. Is that still a viable way of doing things or not? Um, so, to clarify, we're still, we're still using synthesis, but we take the recordings to make the synthesis. And then the model that the synthesis is built from has changed. Yeah. Matthew. Hi, hey, Kathy. Um, one thing that my uh, personal device uh, does very poorly on is when I go running in Gatineau and I ask it for directions back home because the street names are all in French. Uh -huh. But obviously, I don't speak French that well. But I do want it to pronounce the street names correctly. I don't want to be told to go down Rui Chapig. Ch 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 Champagne. I want to go down Rue Champagne. Mm -hmm. um, this, this seems like a fairly common failing. I suspect Mycroft might also have trouble with it. Excellent question. At the moment, you're absolutely correct. We can't switch between languages very well. Our languages functionality is still fairly alpha, but we have been able to get an entire voice stack of things like German and French. What we can't do is go between one language and another language in the same cycle. So for instance, if I ask it for directions in English and you have your voice assistant set to English, it's going to interpret Rue Champagne as English, not as French. I don't know how we get over that until we're at the point where, and I know Google has started to do this, where it can detect the language live in stream. So if I go from speaking with an Australian accent to something very prum and proper with a British accent, we don't have anything at the moment that can automatically do that switch. That's what we need. Patch is welcome. <laughs> Just a little patch. It Emily. Sorry. Um, is, is there a, an art to picking wake words that are distinctive and therefore easier to recognise? Excellent question. <coughs> yes. Um, so if you think about the wake words that are in use with commercial voice assistants, Alexa. 
it, it's highly differentiated. Nothing sounds much like Alexa. Um, same with Cortana. N nothing sounds much like Cortana unless you're an old car enthusiast. <laughs> Mate. Um, <laughs> hey, Mycroft. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to... Sorry? Well, I'm not sure if I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but hey, Mycroft is not a great example of a wake word because Mycroft is not highly differentiated from Microsoft. It's not highly differentiated from Minecraft. And it's not highly differ differentiated from Mike Croft, which are all, all things that the speech-to-text pastor thinks I'm saying. So you've shown us an example of training um, speech corpuses based on it asks you to read something and then you read it back, basically. I was wondering what the state of the art is if I have, let's say, wanted to go from an audio book in the public domain to a speech model of that um, speaker's voice and had the text of the book and the audio file. What tooling and stuff would you recommend for that kind of task? So the short answer is we have all of the end-to-end -end tooling that would require. Um, can I draw it on the board? Is that going to cause issues? Sorry. <laughs> Once a lecturer. So what you start off with is a corpus. So you need your corpus. And the reason that we need a corpus is because we need to figure out um, how many characters each word has. At the moment, our English corpus is taken from everywhere. I've tried to find some open source Australian corpora, but the only thing that I could find that was open source was Hansard. And I'm not... <laughs> uh, for anyone who's not Australian, Hansard is the public, um, public recording of parliamentarian speech. So... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I, I'm not necessarily sure that I want the member for Waringa in my TTS engine. So we need a good corpus. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. mm, that's open and transparent. I see there. So you need, sorry, I'll, I'll try and finish Emily's question. You need the corpus, if you've got the corpus, then you need the recording. So we have the Mimic Recording Studio for that. And then you need to do the training of the TTS. And we have Mimic 2 for that. So they are the three basic tools that you need. If you have a corpus, if you can do the recording and then do the training, you can have your own TTS voice. And yes, big tick against all those three. Yep. They're all open source. I see there are more questions, but uh, unfortunately we are running out of time. So I really want to thank you, Cathy, for 45 minutes of more Australian voice recording. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.